Damn. Hey, thank you, Real Lotus. So listen, I'm just waiting for my counterpart, Miss Jordan, to join on, and we're gonna get right to it. Hey, George. So I'm actually gonna do this too. I've actually never made beef bourguignon before, so y'all know we in this together, right? <laughs> yes. Let's cook and eat <laughs> and drink. So y'all know that we have been doing this now four weeks today. Four weeks ago today is when in Georgia we got notified that schools were going to be shutting down. And then the date just keeps getting like pressed out and pressed out. So now we are in Georgia to the point where schools are out for the year. Hey y'all, come on in. Which is super sad. <laughs> But we're home and we're cooking, we're doing our part, we're doing the social distancing. So it's like, well, what do we do? Let's switch it up. Every Tuesday can't be Taco Tuesday. We gotta do something different. So um, this is an opportunity for y'all to switch it up as well. So I do know that obviously this is Lent season and it's Holy Week, so this might be something where you can just take notes and have it later. And then Jordan is super approachable. You're gonna love her when she joins. She has such an amazing, ah, there's my girl. Okay, I think we're good. So if you're taking notes or whatever the case might be, yay! Hey! Girl, girl. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm late, sorry. <laughs> So let me, uh, I might have to adjust my shot a bit because, you know, this is the first time doing this cooking on yes. the gram. <laughs> so we and make I've it got work. my uh, trusty best friend holding my camera. So <laughs> my trusty tripod. Hey, boo. Uh, my tripod is on its way. So I had to uh, commandeer some, some help. <laughs> Jordan. Hey, what's up to everybody? Introduce yourself. Let the people know who you are, sis. Hello, everybody. I am Jordan, chef and sommelier here in Atlanta. Oh, my cousin's on here. Hey, y'all. A um, little bit. I don't know what spiel you gave. I'm so sorry. Oh, let me get my wine. I've got my burgundy <laughs> ready. The truth. That's all I told them. <laughs> They're going to love you and that you're the truth and that if anybody needs to get the recipe, they can actually email you. Yes, and I will leave my email address at the end. Um, also, as you're making the recipes, for those that are not cooking long, if you run into a snag or have any questions or do something wrong, I can kind of route you back in the, in the best direction and kind of help you out as well. Hey, Aunt Nikki. <laughs> Um, in terms of me, um, obviously with everything going on, my original job got shut down. I'm a wine advisor at Chateau du Pomard. That's what I'm doing now. Um, my friend Larissa reached out to me and said, I had this idea or her man actually came up with the idea and said, yeah. who do you know? And, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, one thing led to another and here we are. So, um, this was a dish that you know, as some of the best foods in the world start out as kind of peasant food, poor people food. I was thinking every time I go in the grocery store, there's always like the cuts of meat that nobody kind of wants and all the ribeye and all the lobster tails are all gone, but there's tons of chuck and there's tons of like stewed meats. And so I grabbed a few and I'm like, this is a dish that is hearty. It's amazing. It's delicious. People are home. It's really easy to make, but nobody really does it. So I was making it last week. You hit me up right on time to serendipity. <laughs> it was perfect. And there's wine in it. It's wine here. It's wine with y'all. <laughs> I'm like, there's wine everywhere. It was just perfect. So this was a great idea to just, you know, stay connected with everyone, get in the kitchen. But we are here for questions as you make the recipes later. I did get a couple of questions from people already. Like, can you make this dish? With chicken, no. This is not one you're gonna wanna make with chicken, but later down the line, we could do like a coco vellum or something like that as one of our classes. So for you non-beef eaters, non-pork eaters, something like that, I got you covered. We're gonna do these classes pretty frequently, so don't worry about it if you don't eat pork or you don't eat beef, we'll have a class for you. But this one was just a nice 
uh, simple but really hearty and delicious um, dish for Easter. Boom. Boom. So, <laughs> all right. Because you know we on the clock. So mm -hmm. I, got, I got all my stuff ready. Okay. All prepped up and ready to Excellent. go. So I'm going to flip this camera around. My friend Ashley is here helping me record. So if she, if you guys have any questions, Ashley will read them to me, but she's just going to record kind of the process. So feel free if along the way you have a question, you can ask it. She'll let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to just kind of get through the recipe. Those of you that are taking notes, if you have questions, just let her know and let me know, and then we'll kind of get through it. Okay. Love Let's her. Go. Shut up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, guys. So um, you'll have to forgive me because um, I was right in the process of getting my house when all of this happened, and then they pulled the listing. So I'm in an Airbnb. This is not my cookware. This is not my kitchen. But we're going to make it do what it do. Always. Um, hopefully, you have your um, ingredients if already prepped. With us, if you're cooking with us, throw a thumbs up in there so we know that y'all are cooking with us. Yes. I know I'm trying it, so <laughs> we get it. And if you haven't already, preheat your ovens to 300. I have um, a stock pot here. If you've got like a, a ceramic pot or something like this, this one's oven safe. I know that a lot of you didn't realize that, but like these can go in the oven. You're just going to need to cook in something that's going to have a lid. Um, so this is what you're looking for. The first step is you're going to heat your pan to like a medium high heat. First thing that's going is, is going to be a bake the bake. Um, let me come back over here for a second. A uh, couple of notes. If you're using pork bacon, you can throw, as soon as your pan has a nice heat to it, you can throw your bacon right in. If you're using beef, beef bacon, you can throw your bacon right in. I couldn't, we don't do pork over here, so, and I couldn't find beef bacon in the, in the um, store, so I have turkey. Turkey is not going to render a lot of fat off of it, so put a little bit of butter or a little bit of olive oil in your pot ahead of time. The point of this was to render off some of the fat of the bacon, and turkey bacon doesn't have a lot of fat, so I'm going to use a little bit of olive oil. If you've got pork or beef bacon, don't worry about that step. Just go ahead and put the bacon in there, and again, if you're already prepped out, they should be in about one inch lardons like so, and We'll just put a little bit in, but we do still want to use the bacon. It's okay if the pan is not streaming hot. We're just going to get those in there. All right. As well as getting in, get some paper towels ready. We're just going to throw those in there. I've got my tongs ready. I've got some paper towels here. And I'm going to do this as best I can. Do as I say, not as I do. This is not hot over here. You're going to want to pat dry your cubes of chuck. Ah. Next step is going to be to sear the chuck, and to get a good sear on this meat, it needs to be dry, okay? Usually I would not do this on my stove top, but obviously because I'm trying to show you guys, I'm just doing it over here. So I'm going to get another paper towel, and I'm going to pat this dry while the turkey bacon is cooking, or whatever bacon it is that you're using, so give me just one sec. Y'all alright so far? Pretty, pretty Wait, so point of reference. We're patting dry the meat and, dry. and we're going to throw it in on top of the turkey or on top of the bacon? No, not yet. The bacon will come out. Once your bacon is cooked, the bacon will come out. Chuck will go in. Perfect. Okay. Regardless of what bacon style you use, leave the fat in the pan, put the chuck in, season with salt and pepper. So whatever speed you're going at, you'll take bacon out, chuck will go in. Okay. And then hit it with some salt and pepper. Kosher salt is always preferable or Himalayan sea salt is uh, kind of the wave right now that I'm on. If you have a moment for downtime, take a sip of wine. Always take a sip of wine. <laughs> is I cook with wine. Sometimes I add it to the food. <laughs> Larissa, what are you drinking? Right now I am drinking the Louis Chevalier um, Bourgogne. Mm. And so... I figured this is about $20. This Excellent. Is wine to cook with. So you can go, y'all know wine is my passport. That's one of my mottos. <laughs> and you can literally go to Burgundy, France for $20. So shout out to my girl. I'm at Three Parks. So with this social distancing, y'all, I've driven my car like for 
twice in a month. <laughs> and I can literally walk to Sarah in five to 10 minutes. So I hit sis up and I'm like, sis, I need this. And she got me. So I'm using this to cook with because again, it's 20 bucks. But again, it's burgundy, it's Pinot Noir. This is Asian oak for about six months or so. Okay. And it's interesting because when I looked it up online and tried to look at the chasing notes, it actually said it's the perfect pairing for beef bourguignon. Excellent. And then for my hard work afterward reward treat, I am drinking the Jean-Luc Joyot Bourgogne. And this is what's happening. I'm excited. I'm excited for you. That Jean-Luc is one of my Y'all drink and put it in the, the comments so we know that y'all are drinking with that. Yes, tell us. So if you're cooking pork bacon, you're probably a lot closer to being done than the turkey bacon. Because you know how turkey bacon is, y'all. Yeah. There's not a lot of fat on it. It does impart some flavor, but the main um, component of this is going to be the fat. I have done this recipe where I didn't do the bacon and... Um, some of you are in different coasts, so different grocery stores have different stuff. But out here, we have a grocery store called Sprouts, and they sell a jar of duck fat. And let me tell you right now, <laughs> that duck fat in this beef bourguignon is crazy good. Um, that sounds I time to run out to Sprouts to find the duck fat, but Whole Foods has it, Sprouts has it. Because those two have it, I would imagine Trader Joe's sells it as well, but don't quote yeah. me on that. But if you can't find that, let me tell you, that's the way to go, okay? Um, Noted. How about duck got fries in your future? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so good, I can't even, like, I, don't, I just, I can't. So this is at a good point for me. I'm not looking for crispy on the bacon for the turkey bacon because, again, this is like a long stewed um, meat dish. Any kind of crisp you put on the bacon is just going to get soggy once it gets in there with all the other, um, the wine and the cognac and all the other things. So it's really a bit of a redundancy to make it super crispy um, because it's just going to get soggy anyways. The point is just to get off as much fat as you can. And again, turkey bacon is not as giving on the fat, but that's all good. Um, you know, the point is staying home and using what you've got. So we're just going to give it a little bit of turkey love, you know, and then throw in your cubes of your okay. chuck. Okay. While mine were on the paper towels, I already liberally seasoned them with salt and pepper. Do not cut the fat off of your chuck. Oh. <laughs> you cut the fat off? <laughs> Not all of it, but there were just some pieces. It was just like because straight. Okay, that's going to clog an artery. <laughs> all those veggies for a long time. You need that fat to just kind of coat those carrots and those herbs and just be all this. Okay. Kind of well, the good news is this is the last time I'm going to make this, but uh, note it for future reference. Next time. <laughs> Next time. All right. So I'm getting a nice, even layer of the beef. In my pot, I'm going to try and make everybody sit because I do not, um, I don't really like doing things in batches because I'm home and I'm lazy. Um, if I was in like a professional kitchen setting, I would make sure I was doing it in batches so every side got evenly seared and all that jazz. So Tiffany wants to know, what do you do with the bacon? You put the bacon off to the side on a plate, in a bowl, on whatever prep surface that you had it on originally. Just put it off to the side. It'll get back added in shortly. Thank you, Tiffany, for the question. Um, I want to keep this recipe as simple as possible. So if you have enough space to get them all in comfortably, go ahead and do that. One thing okay. I do want to say is if you notice that once you put them in, if you guys heard when I first put the beef in, it had a lot of sizzling going. A lot of sizzling, that sound means that um, there was a lot of searing and the pan was really hot. Obviously, I added meat to the pan, which, and the bubbles and the moisture brought the temperature of my pan down. I want every side of my beef to sear. So because the meat brought the temperature of my pan down, now that they're all in the pot and they're cooking, I'm going to 
raise the temperature of my beef just a little bit so that I had it on like If it went to eight, I had it on a six, I'm taking it to like a seven. That's, there's just kind of a dial here. So <laughs> it's not it's not all the way to the top, but I just raised it a little bit because the, the temperature of my pan did come down a little bit and I want to sear on there. I'm not trying to just have them in there stewing in their own juices in warmth. I want them hot. I want them to get some color on there. So I raised the temperature of the pan and then every now and then just move them around a little bit. Okay, so we just want to get some nice color on the beef, right? Is that looking good, y'all? It's smelling good in here. I don't know about over there. We working, sis. <laughs> so you're all right over there? We good. And if anybody that's cooking along, I know a couple of people have reached out to me saying they were going to be cooking along. If I'm going too fast, give me a shot. I'm just going to move this off for a second. Ashley's going to just... Keep it on this beautiful meat. So as Jordan mentioned earlier, you know, this is a classic dish from Burgundy. This is where this dish originated. And there's this rule when it comes to food and wine pairing that if it grows there, it'll pair. So we're cooking with the wine, of course, but at the same time, it's like you have to kind of just have like this classic expression. Oh, yours is brown and real fast. I gotta catch up. <laughs> You want to have the classic expression of the dish as well as the pairing. So I'm excited because this is actually my first time making this. I've never made this before. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy to add this into my arsenal because, again, like, you know, the repertoire starts to get a little slight when you're literally cooking every day. So, of course, we're still supporting our restaurants and we're ordering to go. But... Mm -hmm. Our budgets can't necessarily do that. We're all in unique situations. Some of us may not be currently employed, furloughed. Like cooking at home is obviously going to be the long-term situation for this. Correct. So being able to switch it up a bit is super important. And this is a great recipe to, you can come back here, um, that you can make a big batch of and freeze. Um, nice. So I yeah. love recipes like that because, honey, I thought I cooked a lot <laughs> as a chef and then coming home and cooking for my family pre-quarantine. No, no, no. <laughs> I didn't realize the depth of how much my, I've spoiled my family. Like I've just, I just didn't realize. So now I feel like I'm cooking more now than I ever was. And a big <laughs> of something that go ahead and freeze it in one little container servings. Here you go. Here you go. Get out of my face is, Love you, mean it. <laughs> is, is where I'm at right now because I'm running out of wine. No, I'm kidding. But breakfast, lunch, dinner, like it's happening right now. And so I'm like, I great, can't. but KD Lynn, okay, hi. <laughs> so I'm taking my beef Plus, out. Anything, please feel free to chime in. Yes, please do. I'm taking mine out, as you can see. I'm leaving all the juices in, so don't um, pour it out. Leave all that goodness in your pot. Okay. Keep it on. If you have a slotted spoon, obviously that makes more sense. But again, y'all, charge it to my head, not my heart. This is not my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do these things one by one. I am going to lower my heat back down a little bit. So you got a lot of juice, sis. I don't have that much juice. Hmm. I got some. It's not dry. No worries. No worries. It'll be a little bit different. Um, we got some you liquids did. to add. Uh, so. There's, there'll be um, a little bit of variations on if your beef was grass-fed as opposed to grass. Yes. Grass okay. Grass-fed? Yep, grass-fed. Okay. okay. You'll have less juice then. If okay. you had... Um, Organic beef, that will render down a little bit differently, as well as if you picked an Angus chuck, that'll look, look a little bit differently. But as long as your end result is kind of seared beef off to the side, don't worry about okay. it. Cool. So next into the pot, carefully, is going to be your carrots. Carrots, okay. Mm-hmm. 
Are y'all, uh, for those of y'all that are cooking with us, how y'all holding up? Throw up a thumbs up. Listen yep. here, I'm, I'm with you. I'll try to do 10 things at once. We're still on a medium high heat. Okay. I went back from the seven to like a six. But as um, Larissa was saying, this is um, one of those concepts, if it grows together, it goes together. Um, we paired a Burgundy wine with a dish that was native to Burgundy. This was peasant food in Burgundy. Um, it didn't become mainstream um, worldwide until Chef Escoffier, I think in the 20th century, made a cookbook and yep. put beef bourguignon kind of on the back. Um, the original beef bourguignon, it was like a two-day process, y'all. Like, you had to stew, you took the worst cuts of beef, and you had to stew it for two days to get it to even be edible, because that was how tough that meat was. Uh, now, you, we use different cuts of meat, and we have really streamlined this process, but this was originally um, kind of peasant food, very earthy, very gamey, um, just... Uh, a great expression of the of the climate of Burgundy, and that's why the wines, especially Pinot Noir, the one that I picked, is very earthy. It's got these beautiful mineral notes that'll cut so beautifully with the fat in this dish. Um, a little hint of like chocolate and espresso. I really like the wine. I'll tell you the wine that I picked at the end, but I really like the wine that I picked as well. So at this point, I how have my carrot. Jordan, how much was your wine? My wine was, uh, I think I went, I went reasonable. It was thirty-four dollars. See, total wine. Um, I don't want to get like all over my camera view, but it's like this way. So hold on. Burgundy. So I had this uh, Morons Belle de Vin. Um, it's from Cote Bone. 2014, I got it at Total Wine, 34 bucks. But for 34 bucks, uh, 2014 uh, Burgundy, that's not bad. No, that's not bad. So that's not bad, you know. But this is my sipping wine. I'm going to be cooking with a Santa Maria, Santa Maria Valley Pinot Noir. For those of you that don't know, Santa Maria Valley is an uh, ABA in California. So I'm going to cook with the uh, ABA California wine. I'm going to drink the one from Burgundy. So the one I'm filled with. Yeah. You see, um, a red Burgundy is going to be Pinot Noir. Okay? Mm -hmm. This was actually, this uh, Louis Chevalier actually puts Pinot Noir on there. That is so rare. That never happens. Right. Normally, you're going to see a label like this. And if it's red, it's Pinot Noir. If it's a white wine, nine times out of ten, there are exceptions to the rule. It's going to be Chardonnay. Some Correct. other great varieties that are grown there are Alagote. Bougeron is one of those um, particular regions. And then San Brie makes an amazing Sauvignon Blanc. It's the, I believe it's the only appellation in Burgundy that makes Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, you got your heat up really high. Okay. So what I, we're doing next is medium high heat. I want to um, get some color on these carrots. Now that I've started to get a little bit of color, I'm, I'm not caramelizing them all the way, but as you can see, I am getting, I'll put this one there. We have a couple of questions. So one person wants to know, yes. um, how, if, is it okay if their uh, meat still has a little bit of pink to it? Yes. Okay. It will not My be fully cooked when you take it out. Thank you for that. Perfect. Credit. Yes. I just took a chance. <laughs> and then you just answered the second question about adding the onions to the carrots. Yes. Once you start to see a little browning on the carrots, because my carrots were so much larger than the dice I put on my onions, I wanted to start those cooking first. If you diced your carrots and your onions to about the same size, you can put them in at the same size, at the same time. But my carrots were so much larger than my onions. Had I put them in at the same time, my onions would have burned by the time my carrots got some color on them. So I put my carrots in a little bit earlier, got a little bit of color on those, and then put the smaller in onions in second so that they had an opportunity to also get some color without burning. So, so um, is in Jordan? Mm -hmm. Onions in Say that again? Onions in now? 
onions in now. If you've got some color on your carrots, go ahead with the onions in now. Okay. If you cooked with turkey bacon and you're feeling like your pan is a little bit dry or maybe lacking a little bit of moisture, if you want to hit it with a little bit of olive oil, um, i.e. me, I feel like my carrots absorb a lot of my moisture. I'm going to yep. hit maybe about a tablespoon of olive oil just to give it some, some love. How many of y'all are like me? Y'all just pour until our ancestors say stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't measure. <laughs> I don't measure either. That's why this was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I follow recipes for baking and stuff, but for cooking, I'm always just like, no, nope, that looks good. Nah, I'll throw a little extra in there. I'll improvise. <laughs> yes. One other thing um, that I always do as a chef that I find interesting that I don't see on recipes is that I always see at recipes at the end, it always says salt and pepper to taste. Um, I like to salt and pepper as I go. Obviously, do what you like to do. But to me, I like to season as I go so I don't have to overload seasonings at the end. So like at this point, I'm starting to saute these carrots and these onions. I would hit it with a little bit of salt and pepper and season them now as opposed to at the end I have this stew and I'm trying to hit it with all this pepper and salt at the end. I don't like it. I would rather just season it as it goes. I believe there's a question. Yes, yeah, so someone wants to know, can you, um, do you use nonstick pans? I am not. Um, okay, that's a good question. So, I use what I have access to. Like I mentioned, I'm not like in my usual kitchen with my cookwares. Usually when I make beef bourguignon, I have like the big ceramic stock pots. And I do believe those are coated with like a nonstick surface. Um, this one that was provided to me has a nonstick surface. If you've got like the cast iron pot, I believe those have a, like a ceramic coating. Um, so for something like this, yeah, you can use nonstick. Um, but a stainless steel pot, like a big tall one, would work just the same. You would have to kind of keep an eye on making sure that the meat doesn't stick as you're cooking and going along. But if I had a stainless steel pot, this would come out just as good. You would just not be able to be as kind of like you just have to watch it a little bit more and make sure everything doesn't stick in that initial stage, especially with like the bacon, but it doesn't That's have to be why your stuff is cooking quicker than mine because I'm trying to keep it low so the sides don't burn up. What'd you say? Okay. So I got my onions and my carrots in. What are we going to do next? Okay. So carrots and onions are in. We've got some good color on them, right? Okay. All right, so here's a part that I think is very important. And um, I cannot stress this enough because <laughs> I, got, I got some lawyers in my family, y'all, so don't come for me. We are going to add the cognac or brandy, whichever one you got, to our um, dish, and we're going to light it on fire. Couple of notes before we do that. Turn, <laughs> turn your heat source off. I don't care if you've got gas, electric, you outside, I don't care. If you are using, um, what are these things called? Microwave. Not the microwave, oh. child, the, the fan. Oh, the if fan. you've got the fan going, and like, can you show them my little fan? The microwave has the fan right above my cooking surface. If yours is close, like my situation here, and you're using it, turn that off. Because if you've got a flame and you're pouring alcohol, it can ignite the flame all the way up to your hand. I oh, so we live little... for real, sis. <laughs> we, we live for real. It makes or break the dish, I promise. <laughs> I have a lighter like this. If you don't have a lighter like this, use matches. Take the match and light it from back here and literally just throw it in there. After it's done doing its thing, you can go back in there and pull it out. You will not hurt yourself, I promise. So my heat source is off. I promise you, y'all will be all right. But turn your fan off. Turn your fan off. Turn your fan off and your heat source off. So I believe I said, I don't remember how much of this I said, but do what I said. Fan off, heat source off. Yes. OK. OK. And so we just, our ancestors say, stop. What was this? <laughs> all right. So I've got my, uh, 
I used E and J. It didn't have to be a fancy cognac, right? So I'm lighting it. Got it? So catch your oh. best friend on fire. I'm not catching my best friend. And just let it cook. If you feel like, you can come to me real quick. If you feel like your flame is too high, all you have to do, blow on it. That's it. You can literally blow it out. I like to let mine go a little longer because the longer you let the flame go, the more of the alcohol that you cook out. If you want your bourguignon to be a little boozy, then blow it out right away. But the flame is what's cooking off the alcohol, which will then make the dish safe for kids so they can eat it and not be drunk at the end. But if you blow it out right away, it will have alcohol oh, in it. <laughs> oh, it worked, y'all. I did it. You did? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we have our cognac. Y'all, if you got your eyebrows and all of that, congratulations. But you gotta back up, you gotta relax. If you're nervous and you haven't, if you're not cooking with us and you wanna FaceTime me when you do it, I got you. I'm happy to do it. It's, just, it. a little, it's just a little play, but I wanna make sure. And if you see how I'm lighting it, there's just a tiny flame. There was just a little bit of alcohol. Once the alcohol is cooked out, then all you're left with is the beautiful flavor left in the pot. Fun fact. So oh, yeah. Great. Got it? Okay. I done created a flame. Look we at you. Lit. Flambe in the things. So yeah. what else did you just put in there? I just added my garlic. You add your garlic? Okay. Yep. Turn your heat source back on. Okay. Heat source back Put the garlic okay. in there, right? Now you can add back in your beef and your bacon. And add the bacon too? Okay. Yep, beef, bacon, and any juices that um, the beef we're pulling in, put those in there too. We okay. want all that, all that goodness back in the pot. Beef, bacon, garlic. <laughs> Everybody in. Girl, I'm about to sweat my hair off a little bit. Too. I straightened my hair for this. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where my flat iron is right now. If it's not a out, child, I'll see y'all on the other side of this. Right. <laughs> your nails look cute, though, sis. You don't got no Rona nails. Thank you. Your nails look good. Thank I'm you. holding on to one. Thank I'm you. not going to show y'all mine anymore. It's Thank embarrassing. You. you know, I do what I can for the people. <laughs> <laughs> you were showing your ingredients. I was like, her nails look good. <laughs> How she do know. that? I, you know, I, there's some, I, you know, I just, you know, it's, it's good to be Jordan, you know. Beef is back in too, right? Beef is back in, bacon, bacon's back in, and all that jazz. Okay. Okay? So we got all that in, it's smelling good, it's looking good. Now get your cooking wine, okay? If you have a gas stove, um... Turn your heat source off again. If you don't, I have this electric nonsense, so you're fine. You're going to want to pour half of your bottle of your cooking Pinot Noir. I'm not using my good burgundy. Not to say that the Santa Maria is not good, because I didn't even taste it, y'all. So I'm no shade to whomever this is. I said uh, half of them because I've been drinking. <laughs> no shade to them. But um, for the sake of the wine pairing, I want to sip my wine from burgundy with my dish so i'm gonna cook with the Agreed. Cup. okay so Agreed. half the bottle of pinot in all right okay so a couple of notes are there any questions everybody all right so far we good in there okay so i use these this is my um chicken bouillon cubes um, okay i swear by these things because cabinet space is hard to come by in a chef's kitchen so I use these. I also like those jars of better bouillon. Um, if you've got stock, now is the time to add your stock. If you've got stock, the better than bouillon, I would say two spoonfuls of that in would work. I'm using two cubes of the not chicken bouillon cubes are the ones that I'm using. What I'm going to do is add my two cubes. Larissa, I do believe on your picture you had stock, so go ahead and add I, your stock. How much stock? <laughs> you want to add enough stock to almost cover the top okay. of your beef. Perfect. Okay? 
So with the cubes, for my folks that are using the cubes, I'll show you what you need to do. For better than bouillon, what you're going to do. It's basically all the same. Cubes, better than bouillon, whatever you're doing. I've got my bouillon in, and then I'm going to add enough water to just cover the top of the beef. And then we will add in our herbs. Okay, a little bit of water. All right. All right. Do you add stock and bouillon? Um, she, somebody wants to know, do I just um, stock also? Stock. I have better than bouillon. Stock or bouillon. The bouillon is basically concentrated stock, so you don't need to do both. So if you've got chicken or beef stock, just use that. Okay, and so you see what level that's at, where I've still got about little right. levels of... Hmm? I'm going to show y'all. I'm going to show everybody what I'm working with. So this is where I'm at right now. Looking Let's good. Excellent. Okay. And I'm just making sure you want to scrape down the sides of your uh, pot just to make sure everybody's in there. If you've got the uh, bouillon cubes like I do, just try and give them a little, you know, a little squeezy squeeze so that they can kind of disintegrate and then crank your heat up. We want to just bring this up to a boil real quick. Is this another space where we need to like season to taste, like a little salt and pepper? Yes, I I'm a season as I go. Um, okay, advocate. So I think the more pepper, the better in my world. So I I when I say liberally, I mean it. But do what works for your household. I like fresh cracked pepper, so that's just my jam. But you know, do you? And then a little bit of salt. Don't go overboard on the salt. We're enhancing the food in the dish. We're not trying to flavor the dish. The point of this is to let everything in the pot taste like what it is. We just want to give it a little bit of a, a little bit of love. Okay, so we're not trying to make it taste like salt. We just want to wake it up a little bit. So a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper. And then as that's coming to a boil, I have my herbs here. I have fresh herbs, uh, rosemary in a per world I have string I would have tied these up thrown them in the pot as a little like bouquet card garni is what it's called in the chef world but it's just like a little set right. uh -oh. if you've got herbs add your herbs in now um because I know that it's very easy to just fish these out even though I don't have my string in the pot they go if you don't want to fish out the stems you can dice your herbs up I'm not going to do that because once this is done, we'll literally be able to do this. The rosemary will be falling off of this stem, right? And everything will be ready. So just kind of give it some love, get it down in the juice just so it can, um, the oils, the natural oils from your herbs can cook into your dish, right? This is like one of the dishes that is going to taste better the second day. Oh, you have no <laughs> like idea. It just kind of comes together and needs like that day to sit. Crazy good. Day two is like, and then if you make like a big batch of like really creamy mashed potatoes and then spoon this over mashed potatoes with all the like sauce, I can't even. <laughs> I can't okay. even deal. So I'm going to fish out. There it is. Mine is coming up to a little boil. What you'll want to do, put your top on that guy. He's going into the oven, and I do know that we still have our mushrooms out, right, guys? So this is going into the oven at 300 for about an hour. I will explain to you what we will do in the meantime, and if we get cut off and we don't want to sit here together for an hour, I will give you all the steps to do. And just, it's basically once we assemble the next part of the steps, when the stew comes out, you put it on the stove top, and everything that we assemble next will just go into the stew, You'll bring it to a point, you'll stir it in, it'll be ready to eat. So the next parts of it will, we're gonna make a quick little roux and we're gonna saute your mushrooms. So I have the skillet here. I'm going to rinse off my tongs. All right, so we, we going in the oven, got it, hold yes, on. Yes, go into the oven. I'm gonna rinse off my tongs real quick because they had the raw steak on it. You can start heating up your pan and remember on the recipe, it said uh, four tablespoons of butter divided. Put two of those tablespoons into a skillet. 
and get that melting up. So while I'm washing my uh, tongs, that can go into a seal and you can get that started. I'm trying not to make too much noise trying to find the right cover for my, my <laughs> At this stage, guys, are there any questions? Here we go. We doing all right so far? I know some of y'all are cooking with us, and I know that y'all are taking notes. I'm going to put a little timer. One little note to keep in mind is that the time that it spends in the oven is not going to be like a hard stop or a hard hour. Um, the size that you cut your steak is going to be dependent. Remember, I, for those of you that saw the video on how I said to prep it, if you did it in the half inch cubes, you might be in the 50 minute to an hour range. It might be a little bit sooner. If you did them larger, you might be an hour to an hour and a half. The goal of what we're looking for is if you took two forks and went to the meat, you want it to be able to pull apart with a fork. So don't get caught up on the time. Just get caught up on how the food feels, what it smells like. Are the carrots tender? If you pork it with a fork, can you get all the way through it? Can the meat pull apart? Is it fork tender when you get in there? So if you're doing this at home and you feel like, mm, it's giving me a little bit of pool, throw it back in the oven for a little bit longer. If you uh, dice up your meat really, really small, and you check it at 45 minutes and it's just falling apart, take it out. Don't get stuck on the hour. Just let the food kind of do its thing and tell you when it's ready. So the hour is kind of just a marker. I know the size that I cooked and based on my carrots and stuff, an hour is gonna be where I'm at, but I'm not at you guys' houses. So just let it be kind of a, a gauge, not, it's not law, okay? So, so quick question for the roux, cause I was trying to find a top. So the butter goes in? Yes, we're not doing the roux just yet. Um, I okay. had four tablespoons butter divided. I took two yep. tablespoons into the skillet. I've got mine nice and heated up. It's turned into this beautiful brown butter. Um, because my friend is sitting here on my kitchen counter, and I don't want to burn her, <laughs> I'm going to move <laughs> here and put my mushrooms in there. Okay. So put your mushrooms into the skillet. Okay. Okay. They're not sizzling too bad. Mm -hmm. And then again, a little salt and pepper. All right. So and I'm just gonna saute these down. And then I have my other butter for the roux in a bowl here. Let's see if this is soft enough. Yeah. So I left this while I was cooking. I had this in the bowl just sitting on my um, oven just so it could get soft while I was cooking. So I've got two tablespoons of butter. If you're not familiar with brew, it's equal parts fat and flour. The type of fat doesn't matter. Last time I made the beef bourguignon, in the picture that we got, we posted, I was out of butter and I used olive oil. So it's fat and it's flour. If you had that duck fat I was talking about, you can make a roux. Butter, you can make a roux. Olive oil, avocado oil, whatever kind of fat that you have, you can make a roux, it doesn't matter. So um, if you're trying to stay heart healthy, you can still do it and make a roux. We're just doing equal parts. So I'm gonna do, I have two tablespoons of butter, two tablespoons of flour. But again, I don't, I don't measure y'all. So just take my word for the fact that there was, <laughs> there was um, <laughs> two tablespoons in there. <laughs> over here. I'm like, oh hell, I didn't do that. Shoot. And then I'm just kind of smushing the butter into the flour. If y'all wasn't watching, I would do this with my hands, but I'm trying to act civilized now because, you know, people are watching. But I'm just using the spoon to smush the butter into the flour. This is just going to add a really nice creamy consistency and thicken up the stew when it comes out. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move around the mushrooms just a little bit. Get 
tie them back in there. So you just want to get some color on these, and we want to um, basically evaporate out all the moisture in here. We, we're concentrating all the flavors in the stew, so we don't want to add mushrooms, which are like 90% water, as is to the stew. We want to get all the water out of it, so we have the concentrated flavor of the mushroom without the water added to the stew. So that's why we're sauteing these separately from just adding them straight up. Otherwise, it will just add a watery component. So we're just okay. giving these their own beautiful flavor, sauteing them down. Once these have a nice color to them, we'll hit them with like a tablespoon of the tomato paste, mix it up, turn it off, and then that will just sit to the side. If, um, you know, we'll talk about the wines, Larissa and I will talk about the wines, um, we'll sit together, go through some questions. But at the end, if we get cut off, when your stew is complete, Again, you will take your stew out, put it on your stove top, put it back onto a medium heat. You will add in your roux. You will add in your mushroom tomato paste. Bring it to a boil, stir it up. Remember, your pot has been in the oven. I just say this because I've seen it. Um, your pot's been in the oven. So use a, a pot holder. You're stirring it. And just stir both of these things into your stew. Bring it to a boil because that's just going to cook that flour flavor off we don't want to add the roux in there and then it just tastes like dough so you just want to cook the roux add the mushrooms bring it to a boil and then taste it for salt and pepper if you add it in the big group of herbs you can then pull them out and you're ready to eat um usually when you're cooking in this type of setting it's not a cooking class so in this hour downtime this is also a good opportunity to take. <laughs> you said you're done i'm working y'all <laughs> Uses your vegetables. <laughs> you can make mashed potatoes. This is great on mashed potatoes. This is great with grits. Um, make a little veggies, some asparagus, some green beans on the side, something like that. Pour up your wine. But once this is done, and actually you can show the people this beautiful golden mushroom here. This is what we're looking for. I'm going to cook mine down just a little bit longer um, because I love just a nice sauteed mushroom and I want them all to look like that but this is around what we're looking for we'll add in the tomato paste I didn't have this one open so whatever container you guys have so I'm going to add in about a tablespoon of that okay If you can't find tomato paste, you can use fresh tomatoes, but go ahead and put those in um, into the stew around the time that you made the beef. That would be fine. You can use fresh and see how those are nice and coated in the tomato paste. That's all you need here. This is done. I'm turning that off. My roux is done. I'm just going to keep this sitting on the side. When the stew is done and I feel like it's tender enough, I'm going to take it out. I'm going to drop these guys in there. I'm going to bring it to a boil. I'm going to stir it up and bon appetit. And that's all you need. And then you just. Uh, so then we just add this to when the meat is tender enough to pull <laughs> apart. Mm-hmm. Okay. That wasn't too bad. <laughs> Fat, salt, and pepper, and that's it. That's it. All right. Not too difficult, right? No. But as it starts to cook, your house will start to smell work out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm improvising like crazy. I'm like, just throw some more chicken stock. It'll be fine. <laughs> you got to improvise. Like, my cousin, she called me and she was like, I only have whiskey. I don't have brandy. I said, go for it. The point is to stay home and use what you've got. Let me know how it turns out. So, <laughs> Allison, if you didn't go out for cognac, let me know how the whiskey turns out. Because we're going to be trying. Maybe try that next time. But. You know, just uh, play with it. But this is, it's hearty. It's its delicious. It's, I mean, it's kind of hot outside, but whatever. Y'all, I'm hoping in this box right now. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you guys at on your recipe? Was it, I mean, it's it didn't take too long to prep. It's more of just the, the waiting to cook it, but it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't require a lot to get it done, but it's amazing. And people think, it requires, uh, they think it's super fancy and it's, 
it's pretty straightforward, guys. Any questions? I'm here for this. I think this was uh, this was super fun. Yeah. I got a fish. I'm gonna I'm gonna get it right the next time. <laughs> I'm gonna show you my mushrooms. <laughs> I may have uh, kept throwing the roux in there with the mushrooms a little bit. So we just it's just gonna all work. It's gonna that's work okay. Out. Good. So that's what's important. <laughs> okay. A little more salt and pepper. <laughs> It's all good. So just cut it off when you're done and then add it to the beef at the end and then you'll be... It's just going to be a little extra, a little <laughs> salt bay on it. A little, a little salt <laughs> bay. <laughs> Are you going to tell them some more about the uh, wine yeah, region? Right now, so... I'm trying to find some better lighting, y'all. You're going to be looking in here. Yellow. Where is it? There it is. So I was really intrigued with this. I reached out to Sarah because... Um, she had the uh, Chevalier, but then the next step was like a Jeffrey Chambertin, which was like 80 bucks. So I was like, I don't want to do that right now. <laughs> I'm on the Rona budget. So, you know, definitely want something good and great value, but I don't want something that's going to necessarily break the bank either. So she was able to pull some strings and able to find me this amazing bottle, which I'm super excited about. So I'm opening it in front of y'all. Okay. So there was a question I'm really quickly. This when, is what I'm Oh, I see. When is the roux added? The roux is added at the end once the um, food is cooked um, for thickening. Yes, absolutely. Who's got the music? Do we need a vibe, guys? I need a little bit. I was nervous. You're right. that I was yes. Okay. You if I didn't, if I had the music on in the background, I was scared I couldn't hear you. Yeah, so now that the cooking and we're not listening to all the, the sauteing and we're going to get into a little <laughs> wine education, we need a vibe. And shout out to my lovely camera lady. Thank you, yes. Ashley. She kept, kept it going, y'all. And I'm sure her forearm hurts, but you know, we got to. We got to do what it do, guys. <laughs> Thank you, boo. Amazing. Wow. So I'm not opening this tonight, but I also, I got to wrap my set, right? So one of the wines that I represent is, um, don't be looking at my Rona nails, Landmark, coming out of uh, California. Mm -hmm. So this winery is based in Sonoma, and, um, but this particular Pinot, our Overlook Pinot, is a combination of um, Santa Barbara fruit, um, Sonoma and Monterey. So all cool climate vineyards are sourced from. Very bright tradition. Um, this has a beautiful, I'm now drinking this, the uh, Jean-Luc Joyot, um, 2016. This is delicious. And I understand now why Burgundy can be an expensive ass habit, right? Like, it'll, it'll put oh, you out of house and home. Paris, like, you can... I mean, yes, there are many notable producers that are doing amazing things with Pinot Noir all throughout the world. But I mean, this is the birthplace. This is where it started. So it's like, if they don't get it right, then who could, right? So this is, I'm getting, and I, it's just, it's pollen, y'all. It's allergies. It's nothing else. <laughs> don't be worried about my little sniffle. <laughs> and I was worried. <laughs> but this fruit on this is beautiful. I mean, I'm definitely getting that earthiness, like that mushroom, that potting soil. But the cherry is there, the strawberry is there. It's almost like this underripe condition. Mm -hmm. The city is beautiful. This is going to go so good with the final dish, and I'm super excited about it. Talk about yours. So somebody made a note that your label for your wine was backwards. I'm not sure how to combat that in this setting because oh, good. backwards. Yeah. Can you um, turn your camera around and just – no, like, okay. Yeah, and just Let show me. them your wine just so they can – um see it if they want to go out and grab it there yeah. you go there you go the eau de cote bone jean-luc jolot excellent excellent wine yeah so it was really cool because these vines are actually all exclusively grown in the town of pomar but they are too far away to actually get the pomar designation um it's good though makes me excited this is a super notable producer um been around for many, many, many years. And 
I'm really glad that Sarah was able to pull this out for me. I mean, literally it was about 45, but again, this is a celebration. This is our inaugural, the perfect pairing. So why not, you know, go for it. <laughs> People want to do something strange for some change. <laughs> Secure, you know. <laughs> yes, it's an expensive habit. And I, would, I would love to drink more, but listen, you know, like, Sammy Mommy's on a budget. <laughs> so there's a question. It says, is it okay to go to a wine festival twice per year and stock up on your faves per season? Why not? Say that again. I didn't hear that. Hubby is creating a vibe back here. We got a little uh, music. Yes. Right here. Sure if you can hear it. So I didn't hear the question. Um, someone asked, is it okay to go to a wine festival twice per year and stock up on your faves per season? Wine is whatever you want it to be. Listen here, right? You like it. I love it. So when you say wine festival, I guess I need a little bit more clarity because for me, when I work a wine festival, I'm working it. It's not a selling event. So for my side of the business, when I'm working it, it's more so consumer based. So if you have an opportunity to stack up on what you want, by all means, go for it. And then, you know, again, make sure you're storing it properly on the side, no heat, no light exposure. Typically, perfect scenario would be around 55-ish degrees. But again, if you can't do that, you just want to ensure that the temperature is not fluctuating. Store it properly and go for what you know. I do that. I attend a wine festival during the fall to keep me through the winter. And then I go, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, everyone's right in wine. That's like my number one rule. Um, you know, Shakira and I, Black Girls Nine Two joke all the time, like, I'm not going to drink it with you, but I support you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> My job is to help you expand your palate and show you that there are so many other amazing places that you can go in the world. Like I always say, wine is my passport. Why not take an opportunity to go somewhere? No one's traveling right now, y'all. We're not traveling. I saw some projections today that said at least six months before we're going to be able to go abroad again if we're in the States. Get your passport with wine. Like right now... You can't tell me I got some music playing in the background. I got my beef organ yon. I got my, my burgundy. It's a good night, right? Good and night. I barely left the house today. <laughs> <laughs> um, for us, a four-year-old with leadership skills. So we out here just living our best lives trying to, right? Yes. Um, I was just showing you guys again the wine that I'm drinking. This is the wine that I picked tonight. Um, it's from Morange. It's in the the Côte de Bonne. Um, it has the Grand Vin de Bourgogne uh, classification. It's a 2014 um, Pinot Noir, of course, as Larissa was saying. Uh, this one, 13% alcohol, so it's it's not a it's not a punk, but. <laughs> But you know, if we're gonna be It'll get the job done. But if I could just highlight this beautiful, and I've got some iridescence coming off my wine glass, but it is just gorgeous. It What's really. The... Say that again. Vintage. Twenty fourteen. Nice. It's just um, for thirty four dollars. I got it at Total Wine here in Atlanta, the one in Brookhaven, for thirty four dollars. It's what you need um, a red burgundy to be. This one is has beautiful minerality in it. Um, I picked this one as I was talking, six feet talking away from the rep at Total Wine. And I was saying that I was making the bourguignon. And this is a very hearty dish. As y'all saw, there's bacon, there's butter, there's fat. So you're going to want a wine that can cut into the acidity I mean, cut into the fat with acidity. And so the minerality yes. of this Pinot Noir from a high, um, like a high Appalachian region, France, that type of thing is going to be the way to go. Some of those warmer climate Pinot Noirs, I think are going to be a little bit too jammy, a little bit too fruity for um, a beef bourguignon. Block was hot. <laughs> Come on back, y'all. Ooh. 
Block was hot. They got us. Okay, we coming back. Okay. Are we back? <laughs> we back. Black was hot. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, you know. And I'm going to go and look and see who didn't come back on. Right, right. Probably going to be one of my aunties or so. <laughs> the block was high. They were like, oh, shut it down. Right, like, not tonight. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I was just saying, this one is a really nice, um, you're going to want to balance um, flavors when it comes to food pairing. So if you've got something high in fat, you either need to, uh, you need to cut it with either like a tannin situation, which is why steak goes with cabernets, yeah. or you need to cut it um, with some type of like acidic component. So um, that's why more acidic white wines go with more buttery seafoods. You need to cut the fat with something that is just not going to wash out your palate. So the beef bourguignon is so creamy, it's going to coat your tongue. But if you just added that with a really flabby wine, it would just be like, it wouldn't work. It right. wouldn't work. Um, the Pinot Noir specifically from the Burgundy region is bright, it's light. Um, it's got enough flavor to hold up against the strong flavors of a bourguignon, but it's got enough power to stand on its own, and it's got enough of the minerality to then cut the fat and complement the flavors rather than them kind of like be clashing. So. I, yeah. So there was a question about kind of <laughs> burgundy and the rankings. Let me tell y'all. So when I first started to like really dive into wine and, and really try to get this thing under my belt. France and Italy were by far, for me, like very complicated. I think Italy was harder for me just because there are just so many indigenous grape varieties there. Right. Like it made me want to poke my eyes out with a pen. Um, France, it was almost like the, it was almost like a repetition builds retention thing. Like the more I read it, the more it started to click. The first time I started to read about Burgundy, I'm like, say what now? <laughs> so, so you have Borgogna, where you have, that's the overall arching AOC. Okay. And then from there, you kind of break it down. So you have, um, from there you'll have, so, so this is my <laughs> mnemonic device from CMS level one. It was like, bitch, please vacate my Polini Shasanya for the bone. <laughs> I feel like only some are laughing. Everybody else is like, Let's. village level. <laughs> the Bon Pomard, Bonnet. <laughs> and then from there, you have vineyards. And so with the vineyards, you have these rankings within the vineyards. You can have Promenade Crew, and then you can have Grand Cru. Now, mind you, when you're getting into these, you know, the Promer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lord is correct. When you get into Grand Cru, you're spending crazy money. Like, I may never, ever actually get to try a DRC, um, Domaine Romane Conti. Like, I may never get to try that because it's just so expensive, right? But maybe I make the right wine friends, you know, I'll be in the room one day and I can get a sip. But, you know, again, you can have a really good burgundy without necessarily breaking the bank, right? But again, it's going to be, it's almost like the broader the scope, mm -hmm. the more cost effective it is. When you start to really drill down to that vineyard level, and then you drill down to that Grand Cru, Premier Cru, Grand Cru level, that's when those prices really go crazy. They're highly allocated wines. It's not like you can just walk into anywhere and say, you know what, I think, well, listen, maybe today you can, because... Restaurants are closed. There's a lot of wines right now that are only allocated for restaurants that the restaurants are closed, unfortunately. So wineries are still trying to figure out, well, we still have to make money. So they're opening up their doors to retail. Um, but typically, when there isn't a pandemic, you can't just walk in the door and say, yeah, I want to try this, you know, Grand Cru wine. <laughs> so however, just, say that again. I said, however, your girl is now the, a Burgundy wine plug. Well, then talk about the plug, sis. <laughs> so. Pomar? Is it Pomar? Chateau de Pomar. Come through. Yes. So I feel like I keep putting my phone down and blocking my little speakers. Are they at the bottom of the phone? Because I don't be knowing. Anyways. Hold on. Let me. Hey, 
Mine are up top. I, are they? I have, you know, child, I don't know these songs. So just very quickly, y'all, um, you know, praise God. I got a new job. Um, I'm a wine advisor for a French chateau in Burgundy. Not some of the wines that we're drinking today, but we do have Premier Cru, Grand Cru wines, the wine, uh, the vineyard is Chateau de Pomard. It's in, um, it's in Pomard in Burgundy, France. Um, we're going to start doing some online, um, like Zoom tastings and marketing those soon. People will have an opportunity to pre-order the wines. They will ship straight to you from Pomard and at a very um, affordable price considering, thank you guys, I appreciate you guys, um, at a very uh, affordable price considering what we've been telling you about um, the going rate for Burgundy wines. So, you know, maybe you can, if it's not, Burgundy wine is not maybe in the budget, you can pull together because we're going to do like a tasting. Um, it's basically a tour de Grand Cru. So you'll get six Grand Cru wines for like $300, but six wines with six people for 300. Come on, somebody. You know what I mean? Oh, that's I mean, very yeah. reasonable. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's very reasonable for um, wines, but we're just trying to, you know, reach people during this time and things like that but again my first day is on monday so i'll have more information later but this is um something that i just got you know god is good so i'm excited about I, that there's gonna, be, do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's gonna be more classes and i'm going to be their food and wine pairing online class expert so i've got to get up on my french because child i took it uh, many a year ago so um, I'm gonna work on that but they they do have retail and all that but the tour de grand crew is coming up um, I believe the first class is on the 18th um, but I'll have more information we've got like a all hands on deck meeting tomorrow and um, I'm not sure if the opportunity to get the wines to have them for the class on the 18th is still there because um, it takes about seven days to get your wine which is pretty right. good because they're coming straight from France to consumer um, but for the next class, I'm hoping to be the teacher for that one. So if we want to pull together and, you know, get some wines and hello and, you yes. know, taste through it. And, and then the class will be free and then you just get the wine. But then if you don't, if you're not able to get the wine, that's not a problem. Shut up, Portia. This is my sister in there telling me I'm not shy. You see, I'm not looking at the camera. <laughs> um, if you're not able to get the wine... <laughs> Where we get it all going like this is the battleground right so by the time everybody's clicking you're good we get doing sharing, right yes but if you're not able to get the wine as larissa was saying burgundy is um it's the wine region is difficult the wine bottle labels are difficult to learn and to understand you are welcome to join these classes and just learn about burgundy we'll have powerpoints there'll be slides it'll be a very um, good in like lesson plan on the Burgundy wine region. So if nothing else, just come in and learn about the Burgundy wine region. And then when you come out of this, you'll be able to comfortably read labels and all that jazz and all that. And then once we're out of quarantine, I'll be able to host events. And that's the real part of my job is wine events and in-home wine tastings and all that. That's what I really do. But for now, we're going to do online classes. So uh, I'll keep you guys posted on that. But for now, I'll keep you posted on the classes. So if you want to know more about Burgundy and the region and wine, I got you. Jordan's your girl. Yes. So you brought up a great point, Jordan. I'm going to turn my screen because I know someone said they couldn't read it the right way before. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, this is intimidating. You see this in a wine shop and you're like, well, call it French. Yes. <laughs> I don't see do you know what right. I mean? Like, how do I even try to, you know, decode this wine label? Like, it's intimidating. Mm -hmm. So, again, like, this sounds like a great opportunity to be able to, you know, really help to decode and get people comfortable mm -hmm. with, you know, a very beautiful, but also, once you unlock the code, it's, um, oh, hold on, I came back. Mm -hmm. Once you unlock the code, 
it's like it's, it just kind of works together, right? right. It's like, oh, start to say, okay, I get this, I get this, and it, it all just kind of works together beautifully. So, absolutely. Can I host private classes? Yes, I can, but my territory is the southeast, so I'd have to figure that out with you, Portia. But we could figure that out. But I've got Florida, DC, Maryland, Georgia, Tennessee. The Southeast. I don't know all these little states, but the ones I named <laughs> and then the ones touching Mississippi. <laughs> Mississippi. No, I don't I've know. Been, I've like down. Tennessee, uh -oh. Virginia, Maryland. Oh, you pretty much got the Mid Atlantic down to the Southeast. And then Florida, Georgia, wherever my cousin Allison lives, I can always forget. And <laughs> North Carolina, I believe so. Yes. So I can do in-home wine tasting events, um, events at hotels and wineries and restaurants and all that. When this is all over, for now, we're going to do this online platform. But my job is to do events. So if you've got okay. something in these regions, holler at your girl. Holler at your girl. Oh, yeah. So this I've Someone been asked to break down your wine label. I actually decode a bottle. <laughs> so here we are. Mm -hmm. So 2016 is the vintage. This is the year that the grapes that made this wine were grown and harvested. This is actually where the wine is from, Borgonia. So this is it. So now, Haute Cote de Bonne is a sub region. It's actually to the west of Cote de Bonne. I was actually doing <laughs> some research on that today because it was wearing me out. But yeah, Eau Cote de Bonne is an area that is west of the um, of west of Cote de Bonne. Now, again, these wines are actually these vines were grown in Pomar, um, which is village level. However, they're too far away to go into the uh, Pomar app um, AOC. So French rolls are very, very specific, specifically in Burgundy. Like you could literally have one foot in one particular vineyard, another foot in another vineyard, and you're in two completely different areas. That's how like they break it down so much. So listen, right. now this is Jean-Luc Joyot. He, this is the actual producer. Um, that's the main stuff. But I mean, the main thing you need to know if it's a red wine and you see Bourgogne or Burgundy on the label, it's going to be a Pinot Noir. And then it all just kind of breaks down from there. So if typically if you're going to have a Grand Cru or a Premier Cru, they're going to tote that because that's a big deal. Right. Carry <laughs> <laughs> a price tag. They're definitely going to say Premier Cru or Grand Cru. But again, if you see that on the label, it's going to go, the price tag is going to come with it. So think about it from, you know, starting out here where the cost is very cost effective. And then the tighter you get, you're going to spend more money. That's the easiest way to think about it. Did that answer the question, Shakira? Give me thumbs up. Kinfari, um, no, uncorked. Was I'm sorry, not, I didn't see your questions, dear. It was not an, um, it was uh, not an accurate right. way of how to become a Psalm. The process is much harder. Um, it's a movie, so it wasn't quite how you get to the Master Psalm level. And I, I enjoyed the movie, but there are four levels to Master Psalm and you have to be invited to take the Master yes. Psalm test. You can't just decide you want to take it. They have to invite you once you have passed level three, um, whether you've taken classes, whether you've mm -hmm. um, passed level three or not, they have to invite you. And it is grueling. Um, they touched on how hard it is to get to the master song level, but not even like, no, it's um, much, much it harder. Is. It's 2017 Some peak people. season right now. There are only two African Americans that I believe only two that are Af African American master sommeliers in the world, and they're both men. No, yes, no fem no African American females yet, mm -hmm. but I believe that's going to change soon. We have, I know of at least four or five advanced sommeliers, and we have a crew that's coming up from certified to advanced. That you know, once you're advanced, again, you have to be invited. Mm -hmm. um, be working in a restaurant setting right but what did you truest part of the movie is that most people <laughs> correct <laughs> <laughs> yes so the 
thing about it is this, I mean, like it's, so once you get invited, you have to sit for theory first and then you have to pass theory. And then after you pass theory, you have a certain amount of time to pass service and blind tasting. Right. But if you, do, you only, it's, it's hard. I've, I've, people that I know and respect wholeheartedly have yeah, multiple times. Know, after it and it didn't work but I mean you put them toe to toe with as far as their wine knowledge and they're phenomenal right and again the other side of it is that we've talked about this before we have very notable and world renowned sommeliers who never sat for an exam they just have the time and the energy of being on the floor and having that you know that time to be as credible as they are ultimately it comes down to credibility credibility but to be a master sommelier that is that's Crazy. not my ministry. People are like, oh, girl, I'm like, girl. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Shakira tells I'm, him to watch the movie I'm song. Like, no, I, I think about certified and I get triggered. So that was hard for me. Um, but no, mm -mm. it's not. It, what we saw in Uncork was amazing story of passion, of family, of, you know, uh, generations and how we try to come together and arise from that. But you got a glimpse of what Master Sommelier can look like, but no, nah, that, that joint rough. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Aldo Sam is an amazing example of a world-renowned, credible, completely credible sommelier who didn't sit for any exam, but everyone knows who he is, and he knows his stuff because he put in the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is 2016 peak season right now? Peak season for what, my dear? For wine, it's a good vintage. I'm going to defer because I that's not my area of ministry. What I typically work with is New World Wines, typically out of California. 2016 was a great vintage in California. I can't speak to Burgundy, though. So I can't speak to Burgundy yet because your girl starts on Monday. Um, so we'll get back to you. We're not going to give out misinformation. We can just say, I don't know, but we can find out for you. Yeah, I'll let you know. I I typically go older vintages because I like to, like, drink my cellared wines in sequence. So I'm I'm 10 years back right now. I, I don't know. I, I'll let you know in 2026 how the 2016s are looking, but I'm I'm not there yet. I'm not sure. What's your opinion regarding producing champagne in America versus producing champagne in champagne? Please. Well, <laughs> it's not champagne in America. Mm -hmm. It's not anywhere in the world except for Champagne, France. Um, anywhere else in the world, it has different names, but we're going to particularly, um, specifically reference it as sparkling wine. So in America, there is a loophole where some California producers are allowed to put California champagne on their label, but it is not champagne. Champagne is only champagne if it comes from the champagne region of France. Now, that being said, there are um, some amazing domestic producers that are doing great things. Rue is my favorite, they're out of New Mexico, one of my favorite um, domestic sparkling wine producers, Sauvage, which is their um, no dosage, Brut Nature, um, pretty much that means there's no sugar, they didn't add any residual sugar in the final step of the wine is amazing, <laughs> but um, it's sparkling wine. If it's made in America, we don't have a specific name for sparkling wine in America. Like if you were in Spain, it's gonna be Cava. If you're in Italy, there's gonna be a couple of names. It could be Prosecco, it could be Franciacorta, it could be Trento. There's so many different things it could be mm -hmm. um, in France. It could be a Cremant. It could be a Cremant de Bourgogne. It could be a Cremant de Loire. There's okay. so many. De Blanquette de Lemieux. So the main thing to think about all of this is that champagne can only come from champagne mm -hmm. in France. If you see champagne on the label from California, that's a loophole. They're not even making it the same way nine times out of ten. So, um, but... There are some amazing sparkling wines being made here in America and the States domestically. So the main Carneros is one of my favorite. Yes, absolutely. I've got a wine shipment on its way. I'm ready. Jesus. Gloria is one of my favorites. One of my dear girlfriends got married there. It was a beautiful, amazing uh, ceremony. And so every time I think about, I drink that wine, I think about their wedding. So mm -hmm. I mean, 
Why the history? Why I could take you back to a place, a moment in time. It's your passport. You can travel anywhere, almost anywhere in the world where wine grapes are grown. Um, and it's history. Like, where else can you go back in time? Like, what were you doing in 2016? Probably something I didn't have no business. Ain't got no business. <laughs> Probably. I'm just, There's <laughs> um, just a quick note. So my timer's got 20 minutes on um, yeah, the man. timer. I don't know about you guys' houses that were cooking with us, but my house smells amazing. Yeah, yeah, um, it's smelling good as those of you that jumped on. If you um, jumped on but missed the beginning, but you had the ingredient list, if you didn't get to cook with us, but you... Um, wanted to make the recipe if Doris is going to show me how because I don't know how to work the the phones and the things but I will provide my email and everybody that would like Sarah, how to do it how do you pin a comment to oh. screen thanks charms closet you don't girl um but I, I can provide I'm my email and everybody that and wants I'm it Letting my hair out. <laughs> I forgot. I'll, um, I'll give you guys my email address and I will send yeah. you the actual recipe um, yes. for anybody that wants the full recipe. I know you were taking notes, but we wanted you to show up before you get the recipe. So we give you the recipe at the end. So once we figure out how to pin the things, I'm old, y'all. I don't know how to do this stuff, but we'll give you the recipe. And no, you screenshot the ingredient list, but it wasn't the actual recipe with the steps because some people may have been late or they jumped on and they didn't get to see how to actually do the steps so type in the comments and then in the next you should see it pin. oh well praise god let me see the next is a box okay watch it not work TV jazz. <laughs> shakira is our it queen she knows she gets it jordan oh y'all gonna have to look at my forehead for a little bit this was so much fun so do us a favor, and between Jordan's DM and my DMs, let us know a, a recipe that you might be interested in, and then we'll put our little heads together and come up with something again. Do y'all want to do this again? Should we make this a thing where we come back? Throw a thumbs up in there if that's the case. Okay, so that didn't work, but there's my, just screenshot, <laughs> just screenshot my email address, y'all. Oh. Okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Jordan at wine. Okay, hold on. Hold it's on. Jordan at wine wanderers.com. Jordan at wine dash. Y'all getting such an authentic expression of my face right now. <laughs> I was like, I was just looking at my wrinkles. <laughs> wine dot wanderers. Is that wine what it is? dash wanderers. Wanderers.com. Mm hmm. Okay. Now, if I, it says pose. It didn't give me the chance to do it. Y'all see that? Just go. On. Just scroll back down and get it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, uh, see. You can scroll back down. Go and get okay. it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tiff. I will post it in my story, my email address. I'll put it in my bio. How about that? And Perfect. You send Perfect. me uh, an email. I'll send you the full recipe. Um, we're going to make this a thing because if nothing else, we're bored too, y'all. I mean, ah. We're bored too. Let's say let's do wine pairings of plant based foods, but don't nobody want to eat that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess. We can give people what they want. Every now and then. Um, Thanks, sis. Every now and then we can do some. Uh, oh, there it goes. Boom. Thanks, Shakira. Good looking. So, quick question about my shirts Lotus. The Lotus and the Vines .com. If you click my link tree, you'll see TLTV shop, and that's where you can get the shirts. So they're all custom made. I make them myself, and uh, they're a good time. So I think we did good, though, sis, for our first go. Yeah. Right, this was fun. You know, I'm going to get a little tripod situation, so I don't have to. Yes. I don't have to have this my friends. Like... I had to kind of figure it out. So. <laughs> yeah. I but yeah, for those of you, just a reminder. Time. Throw your root, throw your mushrooms into your pot when your timer goes off. I have 15 minutes left on mine. Bring it to a boil. Just stir it around to cook off the flour. Season for salt and pepper. Bon appetit. And you are ready to go with your beef bourguignon. 
you know, and we'll keep you updated on the next class. Um, DM us on what you, Casule, interesting, um, on some different uh, things that you guys want to learn, different wines that you want to try, um, stuff we can find, though, because some of the people have been DMing me stuff that I'm like, that's not in grocery stores right now. Like, I can't yeah, get these is, things. Our market, Georgia's insane. <laughs> my grocery stores are like when's the next one um i think we're gonna try and do this weekly you know let's try what else we gotta do the baby's Not out of school for the rest of the year <laughs> ratatouille okay okay <laughs> ratatouille yeah okay ashley says a ratatouille would be a good one we could do that. I, i've never made that i'd love to do that okay that would be something for the baby okay, we're gonna screen that scallops proven so okay all right Ooh, maybe That's with weird. some like rose. I'm a good Provence rose and scallop Provençal. Okay, okay, excellent. All right, so um, are we hanging out for 15 more minutes or is it a wrap? We good? I mean, I'm here, so it's up to you. Are there any more questions? Oh, Cacio e Pepe, yes, but I don't have a big That's wheel. A good of one. Yes. 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 Oh, I want to learn how to make that. Yes. Cacio e Pepe? Yes. Okay, but you need a big wheel of, like, Parmigiano. Oh. Well, maybe. Um, I put some blurry. Check my <laughs> Wi-Fi. I'm sorry. That's probably my really old phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Let me, start, about, let me try and fix it. Let me try and fix it. How about Carbonara? I'm going to figure that one out. We got options. All right. Did you freeze up, sis? No. I hear you. Okay, there you go. Is that better? I'm now using my phone data, which T-Mobile don't fail me now. I'm going to go look at my food to see what's happening. It smells good. Is that better? <laughs> Kipfari, tell me. Is it better? <laughs> is it worse? Ashley, tell me. <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> oh, y'all, this looks good. I got to show you real quick what this looks show like. Show the people. Okay. Because we're, I mean, we don't have nothing. It still do. has to cook down some more. It still has to cook down some more, but that's going to be all right. And remember, it's not going to like cook down to nothing. The roux is going to thicken it. I still, I still got some time. So, yeah. But that smells um. You're going to add the roux. You're going to bring it to a boil. So the boil will cook down a little bit. The roux is going to thicken it. Yo, my house smells amazing right now. <laughs> my daughter had to get chicken nuggets because it's too late for her to eat tonight. That's <laughs> Tomorrow. Nuggets, no. <laughs> I was like, sis, you get the organic chicken nuggets tonight because we love you. I uh, like, like adult food, mommy. I'm like, just, just go. <laughs> I banished mine to the patio so she couldn't make any noise. I said, <laughs> you decide where you're going to be. Go outside or come you inside. Decide. But you're not doing <laughs> You're not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we made beef bour bourguignon tonight, um, mm -hmm. Rose Bay, and we're super excited. Like, we're in the home stretch, actually. We've just been chopping it up, talking about wine and life and what's happening with all of us, and then hashtag fun and factual, yes. Um, but yeah, so we just made an entire dish on IG Live, and we're going to try to make this a thing so that we can come back and do it again. So we paired it with, um, oh, my husband came and took my bottle. <laughs> this is real life, real life stuff, y'all. <laughs> what else can we teach them in this time? I need my wine, brother. <laughs> And our vibe. I can't hear the vibe. Hmm? <laughs> well, her husband was doing one. No, you can't. I got music playing in the background. I don't think y'all can really hear it, though, but I'm, I'm in a vibe. Do you guys have any more questions about wine or burgundy? I can give you guys some more fun facts or Chateau de Pomar. Chateau de Pomar. <laughs> I'm so excited about my new job. Tell them who to follow to learn more. Good wine. Good, good, good. So you got to follow Jordan at wandering underscore, I know, underscore. Underscore. I need to reach out to the person that has wandering underscore wino without the second one to be like, do you really need that? 
Is that Come really on. what you like, want to do? <laughs> are you consistent? Are you Come up off that underscore? <laughs> I'm Lotus Vine Wine, so Lotus like the flower, Vine like great vine wine. And then there are just so many amazing people out there that are doing such dope things. So my girl Shakira at Black Girls Dine 2, um, she's been going through the 18 Noble Varieties. And so she has a live on Sundays, I believe at 8.30. Um, shout yourself out if you're in here and you're doing the wine education thing and you're just trying to, you know, show people what the world of wine has to offer, go ahead and put your handle or throw a thumbs up in the comments because this is a movement. Like literally 2000, I think 17 is when I really decided to get into um, educating. Like I've been in the industry for so long, but I just saw that there was this opportunity where we had an opportunity to really elevate um, the everyday consumer, right? And so putting you in a position of power, putting you in a position where you can use wine knowledge as a soft skill. Um, for me, wine knowledge is powerful. If you think about business settings, um, there's two places in particular, maybe three if you play tennis, but the two main places where business deals happen are restaurants and golf, um, golf right? Not everyone golfs, but everyone eats. Hello, and somebody. At a fine dining restaurant, and you just crushed a deal and ordered a glass of Merlot, you kind of hit your credibility a bit there, right? So when you're able to, if not pick a wine from a wine list at a fine dining restaurant where the book is like this and super intimidating, you're at least notable to ask for the sommelier. I mean, that just puts the power in your hands and that just gives you, it gives your personal brand just so much more validity and credibility. So. I saw a need for that, and that's what I've been doing since 2017 now. Time flies when you're having fun. But there are so many of us that are out there that are just, you know, trying to do the, trying to bridge the gap, right? There's a disparity between knowledge. There's a disparity between access. There's, we're just trying to bridge the gap so that the culture, the wine culture, reflects the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And it does it right now. It's getting better, but we know we don't really like the way it's the world looks right so someone asked um what wine regions should they start with or does it matter um i think she means from a learning perspective because yeah. if you mean from drinking girl drink on uh. <laughs> pick one and sip sip hooray but um in terms of learning um my perspective in terms of learning wine, I always like to start at um, the origination of things. And so I would go old world, which is going to mean yep. the Italy, the France, the new world is going to mean like New Zealand, America, Australia, that type of thing. Old world is going to be the European styles. I like to start with the source of things and Great. then branch out from that way because I want to know what were the original wine techniques when the first people that were making wine when they said this is how wine should be um, and this is the best expression of what I'm trying to do I like to start there and then work my way out so if you're looking for um, somewhere to start I would say old world and to me it's like once you've got a good grasp on old world yeah it's a lot easier to learn new world because old world, there's so much to learn. If you can get a, a good general understanding of how to read the old world bottles and um, some of the AOCs and AOPs and it, it, it's very convoluted, but if, if once you get a very good grasp on some of those concepts and the regional laws and that type of thing, once you get to new world, it's just like, there's a lot of ABAs and there's a lot of different regions that make wine, but there's not a ton of variations in terms of the laws and different winemaking practices. So it's just more of just memorizing a lot more information, but not a lot of different techniques. So to me, it's a lot easier to, to tackle old world first, and then you just have a more broader view on the winemaking practices in general. And a lot of the old world practices in terms of champagne, that's kind of the golden standard on how sparkling wine is made worldwide. So once you understand champagne, you understand cava, because that's made in a very similar method. And 
you understand other regions that can't call it champagne, but are making it in the similar methods. So once you understand, you know, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. So once you understand number one, you can understand <laughs> all the others. So that would be my tip. But yeah. I mean, there's, there's always more than one way to play. I've typically heard that people either come up French or Italian, right? Like either, and you, pretty much, I think the easiest way to do it is to start where you where you love it, right? Like, do you love French wines? Do you love Italian wines? Because mm -hmm. it's easier for it to click if you're already dialed into those wines, right? Like, mm -hmm. so I feel like for me, Italy took a lot longer to click than France did. Like, okay, in my studies, I will probably go. I'll probably do French wine scholar. Eventually, do you know Italy Italian wine scholar? But I feel like France's was my way. But I know a lot of people that Italy was their way, and I literally wanted to poke my eyes out trying to figure out Italy wine laws and whatnot. And so I know yeah. we have a, a Spanish um, wine scholar candidate in here too. You know, like so there are so many. Just go where go where your heart leads you. Go where you want to drink, and. If the, only, the main way that you learn about wine is drinking it. So if you love a particular region or you love a particular area, start there. Yeah. And it's just easier for it to click. Yeah. And if you're kind of forcing yourself to learn something for the sake of learning it. Start where you love, and then the love just kind of develops and grows from there. It's pretty organic. Yeah, because I'm the complete opposite of you. I used to live in Italy, so boom. <laughs> Italian wine, I'm like, I'm sleeping, I wake up, Italian wine. I yeah. started to learn French wine and I was like, what <laughs> is this madness? It was, it was so overwhelming trying yeah. to learn French wine. And then I have friends like you that were like, I'm trying to learn the Italian wine laws and rages. And I'm like, mm, no problem. Mom, so yeah. that's a good tip because it was so ingrained because I was there and I was drinking and I didn't even realize how much of it I was picking up just because I was there and that's just what I was drinking. Girl, whatever you like to drink, start there. Start there. That's going to be the easiest one, and then go from there. Are we supposed to feel this overwhelmed? Are you trying to become a sommelier? Because <laughs> wine should be the classy wine. I said, are we supposed to feel this? Wine, is fun. wine should be fun. It should be. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> if you're trying to become a som, it's stressful. It's but stressful, you have bro. to keep your why on those stressful days, like. Why did I do this? <laughs> yeah. I'm doing this. Oh, because I love it. Because I like it. So, you know, always rest in your why. And if, and again, like, if you were just, you know, a student of wine and you, you're not necessarily going after a certification, because you don't have to. You can literally just love wine and explore wine the way that you want to. But, you know, if you're trying to go after a certification, hell yeah, it's stressful. <laughs> but you have to remember your why. Yeah. So, I always fall back into your why. Why did I fall in love with this? For me, wine is my passport. Wine is history. Wine is um, powerful. Wine knowledge is powerful. That's my why. And that's why I want to keep learning. Because every time I think I know something about wine, I realize I don't know much. And that's the beauty of this industry. And that's yeah. why I love especially food and wine. I have studied... I've gone to culinary school. I've studied under some of the best chefs in the world. I have taught and brought up some great chefs. I have gone to classes. You know, I've studied under some of the best sommeliers. I've mastered psalms and all these things. And you can learn so much information and then get around somebody and realize you don't know shit. I not love it. I love it because yeah. you're just not bored. I'm like, I can think you cannot be all knowing in food and wine. I don't care what you're talking about because even at the master psalm level, the next year, the vintage will change. The climate has changed. The, the season for that, that region had changed that year. And so the wines for that region will change. And yeah, there will be some nuances that will be similar, but you can't know all things forever about wine or food, period. And so this is an industry that keeps you on your toes keeps you studying and if you are like me that gets bored with things easily you cannot get bored i have switched <laughs> careers in okay. this industry multiple times i've been a chef for so many years i'm now pursuing 
you know, the sommelier certifications, you know, I have the sommelier, level one sommelier, but there's just, but I'm still in my field. I've not left my field, but I'm still in my field, but I'm not in the kitchen, but here we are doing this, but I'm still doing what I love. You can't get bored. So pursue something that keeps you engaged. Child, I got 30 seconds on my, no, I just, <laughs> I, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I think I'm really behind on comments. Good to show yours first before I show mine. Cause you uh, okay. <laughs> oh, I'll show yours first. I'm trying to get through. Um, I, I was like so far back on the comments, just making sure we got through them all. Cause I didn't want anybody to feel like we weren't listening. I got a lot of. I like full body flavorful yeah. wines. What country features those mostly? Mm. Oh, what's the sign of goodness? I what look for country? Mm. Full body whites or full body reds? He just said full body wines. You could go all off. Of, yeah, all I'm of like them. everywhere has those styles. You're talking red, you're talking white. Yeah. Um, or then go and show your food. Okay, okay, okay. Your food. <laughs> Actually, I need some, I need some assistance. My oven's open. I'm hot. Yes. Well, I turned my, um, my fan on. Just ordered shirts. Oh, somebody got your shirts. Oh, okay. amen. Oh, thank you. Okay, so let me get my little pot things out. That's where you're standing. I, I look. <laughs> All right, y'all. <laughs> I'm only yeah. half dressed. I got on pajama pants and my shirt. So That's it. This is quarantine. Keeping it real. <laughs> you know, I said dress from the, the top half up now. Oh, it smells so good. Um, it's bomb, sis. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So the test is going to be how the meat is. Two forks. Forks. All right. So for me, this is not this is not good enough for me. Some of you at this point may be okay with this. I, you see how I've got some tug here and I could pull it apart, but I want to do this and it just shred apart. Okay. okay. I'm the same boat, sis. So I need to more, so I need to cook down a bit more. I okay. think 15 more minutes will do it. Okay. Um, and at this point, if you wanted to, you could, at, you could eat it and it's still going to be tender, but I want it. I just want it to be like butter when I do yeah, that. Butter. So for me, that's not quite what I'm looking for. So that's going to be up to your discretion. But if you want it to be all the goodness that it's supposed to be, that's where I said just, um, uh, you know, just kind of let the food tell you what it wants. I'm just going to stir it up just a little bit so that the ones that were on the bottom get a okay. little bit more love, right? Just get those in there. Oh, it smells so good. I'm ready, though. I'm ready. Dang, it smells so good, y'all. Yeah, that smells amazing. Okay. So, and then um, some of the, the moisture did evaporate out, so I'm just going to push it back down into the liquid a little bit. You know, make sure everybody's still mostly covered up. And then put that lid back on there. back into the oven i think at this point i would even be willing to go up to like a 350 on the oven you said throw it up another 50. yeah why not yeah i'm gonna let mine sit for like another like uh at least 15 to 30. like you said i want that the meat to just kind of like fall apart and melt so yeah I but can tell where I, the level I, of mine is at 15 so minutes will do it and then add in the mushrooms and the roux Correct. and all that really good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes um yeah Fred, so just, uh, just what's where? I'm just trying to get to the comments I missed what field you are in, Wandering Wino. I am a chef and sommelier. Been a chef for about 11 years. I've been a 
saw him on the floor for about a year, got certified. Well, certified somebody. I got my first certification last year, and then um, I just got hired for Chateau de Pomard as their uh, Southeast Wine Advisor rep. So I'm now working for a uh, Burgundian uh, Chateau as their sales rep in the U.S. So that's my field, but I'm never going to leave food fully. So once a chef, always a chef. Oh, Allison, the smell is amazing. Yes, you have no idea. Once you add that roux in there and it gets that glossy, beautiful sheen and that creaminess from that butter. Oh. I'm like, excited. I was going to say y'all that aren't wife should get ready, but I guess I'm not wife either, so I guess it doesn't work. <laughs> How hilarious. But <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's just... The food well, is good. <laughs> are there other questions before we uh because we've been going for like i feel like i don't even know what time it is i'm just going off of my timer on the stove <laughs> uh, they've been rocking with us for a minute now yeah i i appreciate y'all so <laughs> we're gonna let y'all go if you want to get the full recipe reach out to jordan i pinned her email address she will send you the entire recipe for y'all and we will keep y'all in the loop for next time because this went well we're gonna thank you 916 we've been rocking for like an hour and change we good so <laughs> thank you guys so much jordan thank you for answering my late night text <laughs> yes thank you for thinking of me this was fun i got a text at like midnight y'all i'm like i'm gonna just take a chance <laughs> i saw my phone go off at midnight and i was like oh lord <laughs> please let me <laughs> <laughs> Good. so but thank y'all for joining us we will keep y'all in the loop for what we do for next time we got some really great um ideas but this will be a thing like i mean the energy is good the vibe is there and we're good thank you for joining us please please take pictures of your final dish if you cooked with us or whenever you cook and hashtag tag us and then hashtag the perfect pairing yes because that's oh. what we are. All right. Thanks, guys. I appreciate y'all. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. <laughs> Take care. Bye.